instead of saying there might be something wrong with their framework, the move of cosmologists was to say there must be something else because otherwise our theory would not be correct. So what I would like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to show how it is in fact possible as a hypothesis that in advanced modern science as we know it, trying to follow the scientific method in good faith can be led into a kind of self-reinforcement of errors and get stuck. So the general question that interests me, uh, why I waded into this topic, is what happens at the very limit of knowledge, where physics and metaphysics intersect. Uh, cosmology is situated right here. Uh, it is right where science on the one hand and religion or myth, if you will, on the other bleed into each other inevitably. Uh, and as I will try to show in the following, an excessive belief in the scientific method itself can also lead to a kind of zealotry in its own right. Just a few words about how I came to this somewhat unusual perspective. Uh, so in my long academic journey, and most of it did in Canada, I was blessed and cursed, you could say, by doing all my doctoral research and postdoctoral research across disciplines, not inside of any particular one, not inside of philosophy or science studies as so. I was investigating the role of metaphysics in the formation of modern science. But I also followed uh, what's known as science in action, inspired by the work of uh, French anthropologist Bruno Latour and many others, trying to understand how science moves and works as well. So the traditional perspective in philosophy of science is uh, that science is about realism versus idealism, different ways of approaching truth. But really, science is about doing. It's about producing acceptable research. It's about convincing other scientists. It's about winning funding to do research and so on. So science, as I was trying to map out how cosmology and physics work, it's not simply about truth seeking. It's a production of knowledge. Uh, it's an industry. And I was trying to map this out across theoretical landscapes, not in any one individual silo. But as you may know, in academia, everything is governed by specialization. Uh, and the greater the specialization, the greater the potential blind spot. I had a PhD supervisor who used to argue that every discipline inevitably loses sight of its foundational problem over time. So he used to say, uh, if you want to understand politics, do not study political science. If you want to understand the economy, do not study economics and so on. And so I used to wonder, if you want to understand the cosmos, should you study cosmology? Obviously, there's no particular career path for this kind of perspective, uh, like across the human and natural sciences. But this is how uh, I came at this, this question of cosmology. And so just from the outset, as I'm sure many of you know, cosmology is very different from other sciences in a very fundamental way. Uh, the scope of the subject matter covers the largest extent imaginable, literally, and it does so based only on our own local place within it. So unlike physics in the, in the micro scale, we cannot do repeated experiments under control conditions. We're looking for patterns in the sky and single observations. Uh, just the scope of the macrophysical universe as we know it is at least 20 to 30 orders of magnitude higher than the lowest scale of theoretical physics at the micro level. So this means there's practically no accessible part of the universe where we can do manipulations or and the time scales involved are also millions of times longer than any human life. So all of this obvious limitations and it's possible to question already here based on this how cosmology could be a science at all i mean you could turn this around and say it's quite impressive that we can do anything at all and make any kinds of predictions from the extremely limited region of space that we're in that's visible and how we can even measure it with some kind of confidence so just to consider the scale for a second to measure distance in space we use certain light phenomena in the sky that we figure are quite precise and we use them to guide us. And so in order to measure, uh, measure space, we need a theory and confidence that this theory is universally applicable. So what it means is that cosmologists don't simply observe and measure distances. They interpret them in dependence on the model they use to calculate this distance. So 
there is uh, this is something I've written about elsewhere, but there's a self-reinforcing dynamic at work here where actually the further out in the universe you go, the more model dependent you become. So try to run these calculations with a Canadian physics professor that I collaborate with. And we found that, you know, when you get very, very far into the observable universe, the difference between models can mean 25 to 50% difference in what the scale and the size is. How far, how far apart galaxies really are depends on the model you use. Now, this is rarely discussed because scientists have more or less agreed to just use only one model. So uh, we are left with, you know, remarkably precise numbers for distances. Uh, and this model is called the standard model of cosmology, sometimes known as the concordance model or the lambda CDM model. Now, we all know and are familiar with the idea of the Big Bang, and that's easy enough to understand. And this might be a reason why uh, this idea has been able to capture the imagination of three generations already. But the standard model is like actually quite a complicated structure. So I've been working to map this out. This is one way to represent it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the childhood game Jenga, in which you build a tower of different blocks on top of each other. And if any of the blocks, you can pull out one of the blocks and then the other ones will fall apart. Uh, in my mind, this, the standard model of cosmology is a little bit like this. We have built building blocks on top of each other. So on top of the Newtonian basics that we have confidence for within our own solar system up to a certain degree, we have, uh, with the standard model, the key is a general relativity model, a specific version of it that assumes evolution over time. And we've uh, coupled that with uh, this idea of the cosmic origin, the finite origin in time, which is this hypothesis that, you know, the universe started with a big bang. That is the main framework. And then two key interpretations in the 20th century were hailed as evidence of this framework. Uh, first, the redshift of galaxies was taken to mean that space is expanding. Usually we hear about space is expanding. Uh, what is noteworthy is that this is an interpretation. It's a consensus interpretation of a light phenomenon. Uh, this expansion of space would work really well with this general relativity model that assumes evolution in time. Uh, so this was a, the, this, the, the so-called discovery of the redshift of galaxies and the expansion of the universe was key to making scientists move to an evolutionary model of the universe. Then. The second thing uh, that happened was very important in the 1960s was the discovery of the so-called micro cosmic microwave background radiation. This was discovered, it was interpreted as a residue of the Big Bang. Uh, I'm not going to go into more detail about those things here, but just want to point out that these observations or interpretations, and really only those two, shifted the entire theoretical framework for the universe in the middle of the 20th century. So it's with these building blocks and these two key interpretations, it became a professional discipline with big research budgets and so on. That's the foundation. That's the only, that's the only professional cosmology that we've had. Prior to this, it used to be you know, astronomers and philosophers wondering about how space was outside of our own solar system. Um, it's the only model that we really have worked with in the last 50 years. So standard cosmology assumes uh, the universe has a finite origin in time, um, and this is what's described by the general relativity model. A more fundamental tenet of this is that the claim that mathematical laws that we deduce from our own galaxy, our own neighborhood of the universe, apply universally. And this means that because we assume that they have this infinite or until the end of the universe kind of reach, that we can know the entire temporal extent of the universe from its creation until today, that we can uh, calculate the time, and then we have the framework, so now we just have to fill in the stars and the galaxies. It's just puzzle work from here, is the proposition. It's a very bold uh, project, and it's painting a grand picture, and we found lots of data to match this picture. Unfortunately, we also made a lot of observations that contradict this picture. So one of them, as you uh, know, one, so uh, we just debated this morning dark matter in another panel. That's one of the blocks that's been added on top 
to account for discrepancies between theories and observations. So dark matter was essentially invented in the middle of the 20th century, or in the latter half of it, as an explanation for why our observations of galaxies didn't fit this mathematical model. Instead of saying there might be something wrong with our framework, the move of cosmologists was to say there must be something else because otherwise our theory would not be correct. So there must be this thing. Inflation uh, is something that was invented, you see it at the back there, uh, it was invented as an explanation for how the universe could possibly come into the shape that we can observe today from this Big Bang. That's a mathematical theory for how that could have happened. Um, dark energy was then invented to account for this found ostensible acceleration of space and so on. So all of it is building blocks on top of each other um, to sort of create patches on what the original framework could not do step by step. So today there are some crises in cosmology and challenges to some of these upper blocks, uh, such as dark matter that's been debated here, but very few like very few scientists want to question the blocks below, the ones that hold up these dark matter and dark energy blocks. And I would argue from my research that this, this reluctance to question the blocks underneath uh, is not because they are themselves so solid and proven beyond doubt, but rather because if any of them are in doubt or even slightly wrong, then this entire Jenga tower would fall apart. So it's just too too difficult to start wading into what this stuff is built on. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.